Welcome back. Uh, so once again, we have sort of a convenient transition. The, the issue of worker power and the, and, the, and the idea of sort of fundamental economic reforms and building up workers' wages in, in, in addition to building up their skills came up in the last panel. Um, so there's going to be a, a whole bunch of threads, I think, running through all the panels of this conference. So I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, the moderator of the next panel, uh, who is Eduardo Porter. He's an economics reporter for the New York Times. And if you follow economic news at all, you have almost certainly read his columns and, and pieces, whether you know it or not. Uh, a quick scan of some of his recent work today uh, shows that he, he writes on just about every topic that we cover in this conference and then some, um, everything from you know, the impact of uh, technology on the workforce to the challenges faced by rural communities, uh, the mobility of the workforce, um, the impact of, of technology on jobs, uh, really just about everything that we're going to touch on here he's written about in the not too distant past. So. Nobody better to moderate the next panel than Eduardo. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm sure you don't know me because nobody ever reads the bylines in the stories, <laughs> except for other journalists. Um, but I, I, I find it super interesting how the theme of distribution, distribution of opportunity, distribution of prosperity, has become so central to the national conversation about our economics. Two weeks ago, I was moderating another panel in Washington at the National Press Club for MIT's Future of Work Task Force. And there it was, you know, how we can make a high-tech, uh, AI-heavy future work for everybody. Tomorrow, I'm going to be in Boston at a conference about why, how large swathes of the economy are being left behind by, by prosperity. A week from, t from, from, from now, I'm going to be back in, in DC talking at a conference at the Peterson uh, Institute, which is about what tools we have to mitigate inequality. Now, I mean, I'm, I, I'm glad that we're doing this, but I'm amazed. I, I think this is a remarkable turn of events. Um, so when I started writing about this, about the American economy about you know, 20 years ago, the issue of distribution was really not on the radar screen. You know? In fact, economists from back then, had they been looking at the stats from the labor market today, you know, they'd say, whoa, this is going to be an age, a golden age for workers. You know, we have the tightest labor market since World War II. Um, wages in real terms are actually inching off at the fastest pace since the 1990s, you know. And economists, you know, kind of like looking at, at all the AI and the machine learning and all that stuff, you know, they would have, they would prescribe for sure a, a future of, blistering productivity growth and rising living, living standards for pretty much everybody. Now, now, the public was never really convinced of this story. And now, you know, having written about this stuff for 20 years, you know, sadly, I've got to confess that, you know, they had a point. Their skepticism was warranted. Uh, because there's too many working men and women for whom the past two decades have really been essentially lost, you know? decades of stagnant wages and growing job insecurity, um, in where hard-earned skills have been rendered irrelevant by, by the robots. And so distribution is back on the table, and rightly so. You know, even economists are coming to realize that prosperity on, 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 at the mean, on average, is not really the relevant metric uh, uh, for, for our society's well-being, and that you know, how prosperity is shared is becoming much more important than how much it is growing uh, at the mean. And so this awareness, which I think is remarkable and good, is, is what gathers us here today. So we have this great panel of uh, very distinguished uh, uh, people, which I'm going to introduce to you. It's, we have Vinnie Alvarez, who's the uh, president of uh, New York City Central Labor Council for the AFL-CIO, Maureen Conway, who's the executive director of the Aspen Institute's Economic Opportunities Program, Randy Weingartner, the head of the American Federation of Teachers, and Felicia Wong, who's the president and CEO of the Roosevelt Institute. So these, uh, this panel is going to you know, share their insights into the nature of the problem, which is essentially a labor market that provides too little to so many working men and women and ideas about how this maldistribution of opportunity and prosperity can be corrected. So to start, I just wanted to throw a question out there for everybody briefly, you know, in five minutes or so. If you could tell us from, from where you sit, how do you describe the problem? 
uh, what's the nature of, of the problem? I mean, you've seen the same data that I have, you know, stagnant wages, galloping inequality. Well, what happens? So Randy, I don't know if you want to take this um, first. So Testing. Yeah, now it's green. See, that's AI for you. <laughs> um, so I think that chart that showed um, the reduction of the labor movement over the course of the last um, 10, 20, 30 years could explain a lot of this. Um, that I think that there is, I mean, Eduardo, first of all, I do actually read your byline. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, it's, and you were one of the people who actually got me started to think about rural America and what has happened there, and I'll talk about that for a second. But I think at the end of the day, it is how do we level the playing field so that workers actually have some power again in a meaningful way? And at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of other things that can be done, including raising the minimum wage, and then you know Tim Ryan talks about an industrial policy or things like that. But in capitalism, one, and I am not an economist, I am a labor leader, I am a teacher, I am a lawyer. Um, but if, if, if in capitalism, worker power is the check and balance to um, uh, capitalist impulses. And frankly, if I was a conservative, which I am not, I would <laughs> actually argue that to avoid too much government intervention, you would actually want to have strong unions within your shops so that a union negotiating with a boss could actually be a very powerful check and balance but it could also make sure that the solutions are contoured to what the shop needs, what the industry needs. Um, and what has happened over time, and you see this in a whole lot of data about the unit advantage and things like that, but what has happened over time is that with less and less union density, and particularly almost no union density in huge swaths of the labor movement, what will create any power for workers, and at the end of the day, the you know when you join together, you can actually accomplish what is impossible to accomplish alone. Betsy DeVos has personal power, and she has power because of her wealth. The Koch brothers have power because of their wealth. Most individual workers, I don't care how smart they are, how industrious they are, how what, they don't have that kind of power that you need when you could either withhold your labor or you can create a, a, a public campaign or things like that. And that's why I think it is, abs and, and, and look, you see this in terms of, in, in this campaign, you see Julian Castro yesterday put out a labor policy. Elizabeth Warren put out a labor policy. I think Elizabeth Warren la labor policy ta said the word power about 12 times. And there <laughs> has to be a way of, of leveling the playing field by recreating power. Thanks a lot. I don't know, Maureen, if you, you want to go. And you, you, I think you have some, I, I, I wanted to ask you, if, if you would take this on, is, is there an opportunity for collaboration between labor and capital, between employers and employees? <laughs> I was reading parts of Elizabeth Warren's uh, proposal this, this morning, and it's quite uh, Elizabeth Warren-esque. It's, it's, it's very, though, you know, punch the corporation, but is there space for something that is more more collaborative? Yeah, well, I think so, but I'm gonna start first answering your first question, which was kind of what happened, and what happened kind of from where I sit. So I run the Economic Opportunities Program at the Aspen Institute. I've um, been at the Aspen Institute for over 20 years, and you know the work we do, we work across communities looking at what a variety of nonprofit, local government organizations, and others are doing to try to help uh, low-income people in those communities 
uh, connect to better economic opportunities, hence the name. Um, and so, uh, and, and you know, so, so what I see kind of having happened in, in the work that we do in research on those strategies is, is, you know, sort of I came into this kind of in the um, end welfare as we know it era, right? And so what did we do when we ended welfare as we knew it? We, we kind of said in this narrative, like, the way to help people, poor people is to connect them to work, right? And so we're gonna encourage people to work and we're gonna get a whole set of policies that are designed to be punitive if you don't work and encourage you to work and not that rewarding if you do work, right? Because while we were encouraging people to work, we weren't really encouraging people to pay them to work. So that was kind of the part that we missed. So, so what did we do? We set up, um, you know, so we put work requirements on food stamps. Our, our largest social assistance program now is the earned income tax credit, right? And so roughly 27 million people got the earned income tax credit. That gets to you about like one in six workers. Um, that's 80% of people who are eligible actually get it. So you get to like one in five are actually eligible for it. So, so we have this real problem of sort of encouraging people to work, but not encouraging work to pay. And you have to ask yourself sort of how far do we really want to go in policy terms? You know, now there's lots of calls to expand the earned income tax credit. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy the earned income tax credit is there for the people who need it, absolutely. But, you know, how far do we want to go in asking people to go to work for a private company and ask your ordinary taxpayer to be the one responsible for paying them? So I really think we have, we have to think about that. And I think this sort of policy framework in which, you know, sort of poor people get a drop and not quite poor people don't get much is also part of what has encouraged, you know, sort of people who have little to resent people who have less. So I think we should really think about the ways in which these, these policies that are, you know, intended to help the very poor, but they don't help sort of ordinarily struggling workers have really exacerbated the ways in which we have divides. And, you know, I can sort of think of that in my own family, and many people probably have family members who sort of fell on hard times, but not quite hard enough times to be eligible things, and kind of started really feeling resentful about people who did get help because they didn't. Um, so I think that that's, that's sort of part of what happened. Um, the other thing that I kind of, that I, that I want to mention about that, you know, obviously uh, welfare reform was largely about women, right? It was about women and children. Um, and, you know, I think as we think about sort of um, these issues of, of poverty and working poor, we should keep in mind that poverty is disproportionately women, disproportionately people of color, um, disproportionately younger workers. And, you know, so as we think about where we are today and think about what are the jobs that are out there, what's the quality of those jobs, which jobs are growing, right? I look at sort of the latest BLS projections and, you know, home health aid, right, is not only one of the largest occupations, but it's also one of the fastest growing. It's also an occupation that is poverty waged by policy choice, right? And why are we comfortable with that policy choice? Well, who does that work? It's women, it's largely women of color, often immigrant women. And so I think we have to think about, and this is something we think a lot about in the Economic Opportunities Program, it's how do our issues and our divides, our, uh, how the issues of race, gender, and also place and geography, how do those influence sort of our economic opportunity landscape and our perceptions of sort of what work is valuable and what work isn't valuable and which work we're willing to pay for. And so I think we just, you know, our policy frameworks need to really grapple with those issues um, and need to focus on addressing these systemic biases. But also I think if we want to think about how do we make work pay, we need to think about sort of policies that can either encourage higher wages, but also, um, you know, this is where healthcare and childcare and other policies come in. How do you also lower the cost of living for people? So I think that is kind of an important frame to bring to our, our policy frameworks. Then on the collaboration point, I really think there is opportunity because I also think there's a different way to think about what's good business and how do we incentivize different business models that, are, that, that create higher quality jobs, that create jobs that are designed for productivity, that create jobs where people can contribute more towards business success and cr start creating those more cooperative frameworks where, um, where companies and where their workers can succeed together rather than companies and their workers being in opposition to each other. So we can talk about that more later. Great, thanks. Um, and Vinny, let me, let me turn this to you. And um, I'd, I'd love to take the opportunity, since, since, since you sit on the board of the 
Federal Reserve Bank of New York, you have a, like a, a, an interesting perspective on, on macroeconomic policy mm -hmm. and how you know, the macro affects the condition of, of, of working men and women. I'd love to, 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 to get your sense, if you have a, if you have a, a thought about this, is you know, in the 1990s, in the era of welfare reform, Maureen was talking about, there was a sense that tight labor markets were everything, right? In the, the Clinton administration, there were very tight labor markets, wages were rising, and you know, there was a sense that this was actually going to bring prosperity to, 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 to workers. Right now, we're in very tight labor markets, but wages are not really, they've taken a very long time to rise. And the rise seems quite precarious. So I wonder if you know, tight labor markets don't do the job that, that, that they used to do? Well, I would say <coughs> first to a couple, uh, a couple different things, because I think we have to get back to the, uh, the point that Randy made and opened up with, with regarding power. But also, when you talk about the 1990s and the expansion that we had, and the economic expansion in the 1990s, we're over roughly the same period of the economic expansion we've had since the uh, Great Recession. If you look at 39 to 40 quarters, the aggregate growth that we've had in this expansion is about half of what it was in the 1990s during the same period of time. So the two expansions are not, uh, economic expansions are, are not equal from the perspective of growth. They're also not equal, Randy talked about power, and it isn't, it, this really is a story of power and the relationships in the workplace between workers and their employer and how an imbalance, when it exists over a long period of time, has real material consequences, both for individuals, for communities, and, uh, and for the country, and for our economy as well. There are, we, we mentioned earlier graphs. We have these two graphs. And we, we actually have now two roughly 35, 40 year periods of history, where workers had power, and we see graphs that are exactly the opposite where incomes were rising, productivity was rising, upward social mobility in this country was, uh, was something that was still possible from generation to generation. And the past 30 years, we've seen the exact opposite happen, with the exception of productivity, which still continues to rise, certainly, in this country. So I think that it's impossible to talk about the issue of raising wages, the issues of pay and, and benefits without talking about the issue of power and how that power is, uh, exists in the workplace today as we've seen it, um, as, we've seen, as we've seen workers' power continue to diminish over the past 30 years with policies that have been advocated from and advanced by very uh, corporate-backed um, um, influences throughout this country and in various states throughout, throughout the country. The second thing is the effect of the lack of, uh, the effect of, of, of the imbalance in power which exists in, in the workplace also has had a dramatic effect on, um, on benefits. Here, even in New York City, now New York City has some of the highest rates of inequality. It also has, has the highest rates of uh, any regional um, location throughout the country of unionization. But even in a city like New York, where you see this crisis where we have a retirement security, 65% of people in New York City have, have no form of retirement security whatsoever. It's a staggering amount. That figure eight years ago, when I when I first assumed the role in the position that I'm in now, was at 59%. It goes up each a little bit each and every year. It's the worst kind of crisis to address because it's a slow motion crisis. But that again, when we talk about the issue of, of benefits, whether it be retirement security, whether it be the lack of, of, of adequate health care, whether it be shifting who is responsible for that health care in the workplace to workers, those are all direct consequences of the loss of the, of the balance of, of power shifting away from workers. And, and towards the employer. And the last thing is that this has real dramatic consequences for our, our economy. And there's no question about it. When you look at the consume, when you look at, 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 at um, consumer spending being three quarters, two thirds to three quarters of GDP, it's impossible to, to not, and, and when we talk about how, while we've had a, a long recovery now, certainly since the recession, it now makes more sense when you say, well, we've only had roughly 22 to 25% GDP, whereas in the recovery we've had in the aggregate, the aggregate um, 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 recovery that we had during the 1990s was somewhere around 45%. It makes sense when you see that there's less money going into the pockets of workers. And why this matters is because all of this leads up to this real economic inequality and this income insecurity that we continue to see um, um, throughout the country region to region, sector to sector, and it is something that I think at, at the end of the day we got to look back to how 
what is the nature of the problem, and some of the nature of the problem from our perspective has to go back to the to uh, how power the is is uh, is distributed in the workplace between an employer and a worker. Thanks a lot. Um, Felicia, I want to turn it turn turn the question to you. Uh, you guys have done at Roosevelt have done some really great research on this, and um, so I wonder if I if I could if I could ask you to if you could address the issue of well, what's the role of globalization and technology in these dynamics because we're speaking a lot of how the balance of power has right. shifted between workers and employers, but I haven't yet heard about these broader economic forces that are playing on this. Right. Well. Um, Eduardo, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you okay. because I, I, I fear that I'm going to make uh, your panel somewhat uninteresting in that I'm going to plus one or maybe plus two both Randy and Vinny's emphasis on power. But I will answer your question about globalization and technology, which is to say there is no question that you see movements, obviously technological progress, obviously uh, hugely different um, ways of thinking about uh, international relationships, globalization. Uh, you know, you do see far more porous boundaries um, in the world. Trade looks very different today than it did 50 years ago, and of course that makes a difference. But what I think we have to understand is that those forces are at the very bottom, kind of the, perhaps they're the most fundamental forces that are uh, affecting the way American workers and American families uh, experience the economy or experience their lives in everyday society. But that is mitigated through this web of policy choices. And those policy choices are absolutely influenced by power. So, you know, very often at a conference like this, this is a policy conference, I run a policy institute, you know, we, we talk a lot about the, pol the problem as policy. Well, I'm here today to say that the problem is not fundamentally one of policy. We have a tremendous number of excellent policies out there. You actually see them on the campaign trail today, whether they're legislative policies around wages, whether they're institutional policies around um, kind of how to strengthen unions, whether they're corporate policies around antitrust and anti-monopoly. There are plenty of policy ideas out there that could if not completely solve, at least make a dent in the kinds of problems Americans are facing today. So the, the problem is not that we don't have ideas, number one. Number two, the problem is not that we don't have political will. Like, no matter what poll you look at, the majority of Americans, it's usually pretty much all Democrats and about 20% of Republicans, actually agree with a kind of policy agenda that I would call broadly progressive, but you know, actually, if 70% of Americans agree, I would just call it majoritarian. Um, so the problem is not one of political will. The problem is instead what both Randy and Vinny said. It is an imbalance of power. I would certainly say that it's union power. I'd also go so far as to say that it's imbal an imbalance between corporate power and government power directly. Um, and so just a couple of ways in which I know that this is a problem, you know, if we were, if you, if we really had robust competition in our markets, which is something I know that you've written about, right now we have very concentrated, very sclerotic markets. If we had more competition in our markets, firms would have to pay workers more to keep them. No question. If government were a stronger force, had more countervailing power, we would in fact see higher minimum wage, we'd see better antitrust, we'd see a lot of, a lot of the kind of policies that I think are in fact popular would also be uh, enacted by within a democracy, second piece. And then the third piece, you know, if labor unions today were really a strong countervailing power, you would see checks on the kind of corporate behavior uh, that currently exists and is currently causing harm. I'm not going to say, I'm interested in the question of cooperation with uh, business. I think it's essential. Um, but we've got to cooperate with business, and Randy would be the first to say this, on equal terms. We got to come to the table together. Um, and if unions were stronger, and I think there are a lot of ways to make unions stronger, um, if unions were stronger, they would be a check on the kind of predatory corporate power that we see today. 
not just in technology, because I know there's a lot out there these days about the problems with you know the big tech companies, Facebook, Google, et cetera, but um, throughout every single sector, retail, manufacturing, you see predatory behavior, every pharma, you see predatory behavior everywhere. This is actually something that we could stop. To not do so is to make a choice. Randy, you wanted to jump yeah, in there? I, mean, I just, I wanna add to, with a story, um, something that Felicia just said. So, you know, I've talked, I've thought a lot over my life as a union leader and as a bargainer about um, collaboration. And I actually, I believe in solution driven bargaining and how you actually have to have as a union the responsibility of the shop in either private sector or public sector. I mean, in public sector, I'm an institutionalist and I really believe in the institutions of government, at, and, and warts and all, public education, warts and all, but, and that, that, you, that you as a union, or you as a teacher, or you as a public service worker, you have to feel fidelity and responsibility to the work that you're doing to make a difference in the lives of others. And so I've, I have always, and I think my record probably shows this, believe in how do you actually collaborate and cooperate to make the work better, to make a diff pay, make public services better, and I would argue that, you know, GM and or UAW and the Saturn bargaining, some of the bargaining to keep you know plants open in the same way they people tried to do that. But Felicia is absolutely right in that if you do not come to that table with equal bargaining power where your ideas are gonna be listened to and you kind of do the what ifs, the what ifs. And, and if management feels like you don't, that, that you don't have that kind of power, that, there, that that's, it's simply a matter of a contract of adhesion or it's a yellow doll contract or something like that, you're never gonna actually get to what are the best solutions on the ground. And frankly, given automation and given technology and given everything that's coming at us, because whether it's this industrial revolution or the ones beforehand, there's always changes in the economy. And so if you don't actually come with really good ideas from all sides and come and do the what ifs, you're never gonna get the best ideas. But that requires equal, that requires at least equal reverent power. And so when, what I've seen in my life is that when, when our management, for example, is really, has really run out of ideas, it's when we have done our best bargaining. Like in New York City, when we started the Chancellor's District to actually turn around low-performing schools. When um, Rudy Crew and Rudy Giuliani were, at, were fighting with each other, and so Crew had to come up with a better idea for how to turn around schools, so he turned to us, and we came up with ways of turning them around, and we turned around every single elementary school. Or in McDowell County, West Virginia, which is the eighth poorest, count, poorest county in, in the country, when the management, the state had done everything and threw up their hands and said, we can't go through another superintendent. We have taken over the district. We, we've done all the kind of reformy kinds mm -hmm. of things that a Joe Klein or a Barack Obama or an Arne Duncan would tell you to, or Michelle Reed would tell you to do. Nothing has worked. So you had the then governor's wife and governor, Manchin and his wife, ask us to come in and be partners. And we said, we're not gonna take over the school system, we believe in public education, but we'll be your partner with it. Fast forward, eight years later, graduation rates are up 20 points. But no one else wanted, like the DeVosses, the Koch brothers, they didn't wanna muck in it because everything that they had wanted had already been tried and failed. And so what we have found is that when all else fails, People have called us in to be equal partners. And those kinds of things, you can actually do the creative work together um, to actually make a difference. Sorry, can I just add one tiny thing which go, will make me sound go. a little bit more think tanky than I just did. It's probably my job on this panel. Um, <laughs> you know, one thing about power is that we, 
often don't have a good way to quantify and study and actually understand it. One of the exciting things about economics right now is that more and more economists are actually trying to understand how to, util how to measure and understand power in the economy as an actual causal variable. I think that's very important. Um, I just saw Steve Vogel in the audience. Uh, Steve, you know, political scientists are also trying to get better at their understanding of power as a causal variable. I do think it's an important part of how we conceptualize our system to actually use power. You guys use power all the time every day, but I think thinkers have to take it very seriously as well. Okay. Can I, can yeah, I just yeah. say one thing on that point? Because I think it's interesting, this whole focus on, on power and sort of like do economists think about power and everything. So, so I'll just say, so I actually started a PhD in economics at one point and I'm married to an economist and some of my best friends are literally economists. So I like economists. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nothing against them. <laughs> so right, so I'm not going to. But I also went to business school and I also like did a planning degree and focused on economic development. So I've thought about like economics in these very different disciplinary ways. And it's really interesting that economists are now just starting to think about power, right? Because in business school, it's like the first thing they teach you, right? Like, what do they teach you? They teach you Porter's five forces. Okay, let's think about power of suppliers, power of buyers. Let's think about the threat of substitutes and new entrants. And let's think about what's the, the competition and how do you build power here so you protect yourself from competition. And this is how you... So anyway, it's just really interesting because I think you absolutely do have to think about power. And if you're not thinking about power, then you know, right, and, and so I guess like in this, you know, how do you work with business, like negotiate, right? I mean, that's what you should do, that's what they're gonna do. Um, so I wouldn't take that away, but then I think you have to think about, well, what are the different narrative, how do you also build some narrative power so you start bringing everybody with you in terms of what's your story of the economy and how do we sort of all succeed together? But yeah, it's interesting. Vinny, you wanted to? Well, there we are. When we talk about the, uh, we've talked a lot about power and the relationship between workers and employers, but there really are practical consequences. Randy was talking a lot about uh, New York City and it, and it made me think about, you know, there was a time in New York City when prior to public sector workers even have the right to collectively bargain in the late 60s, <laughs> where they were not even on par with private sector workers and their incomes were, uh, and they were struggling to have a level of, of a middle class lifestyle that many other private sector workers had in that city at the time. And it was a direct result of the collective bar of, of collective bargaining rights and of the public sector workers getting more power through, uh, through that process in New York City that now we have places like South Jamaica that some, some, some of the highest African American home ownership because of civil service and because of the presence of public sector workers who have collective bargaining rights and who have a degree of power in the relationships with their employers. So there's a real practical consequence for that. Um, but we've also, I think, had to acknowledge that maybe some of the, because we, we hear a lot about how this economy is an expanding and growing economy, and that, that, that we've, we're in the longest expansion that we've had in many years, and that everything is just peachy, and it's not. And if it is, why do 40% of Americans today can't come up with $400 of emergency money? Why is it that I said that we have this high and growing crisis of retirement uh, security? And why is it that 80% of families, 75 to 80% of families in this country are living paycheck to paycheck if the economy is doing so well. So I think we also have to talk about what are the, what are the traditional measurements that we use to judge, to determine and evaluate the well-being of our economy. When we, and, and are those appropriate enough of a gauge to really talk, to really uh, uh, gauge the economic well-being of, of, of everyday working class Americans? Because if they were, why then do we such a, have such a high degree of income insecurity and economic inequality which exists in this country? But okay. can I? Yeah, and then you, ca you guys cannot. <laughs> <laughs> ask a question first. Okay, go. Go around. No, but, but I also think it's, so as, as a person who started talking about power, I also think that we have um, a cultural issue. In the and and this and uh, some myth busting that we have to do. There are people that work really really hard, and are living paycheck to paycheck, and there's a notion that if you work hard and play by the rules in America, you will get ahead. And there are things that are broken in the economy, and this is where I think policy is important, it to kind of change this. So for example, on student debt. If you, I mean, 
$1.6 trillion of debt, 40 some odd million people. This is an economic issue. And I hear all too often people saying, well, I got through my student debt, why can't anybody else? And it's really different today than it was 20, 30 years ago. So I do think that there is a role for kind of fundamental policy shifts that also help level the playing field, but you need to actually have kind of a, a, a change of this cultural, America's always been marked by this kind of rugged individualism versus social compact. And I think that we need a little bit more of the social compact moment as opposed to the rugged individual moment. Cool. Just before I, I ask the next question, I just want to let you all know that we're going to have a very short, maybe 10 minute uh, moment for Q&A. You guys have been given cards to write questions that you might have down, and somebody's going to bring them to me, and so I'll, I'll um, so I can ask questions. So if you have a question, just please jot it down on the card and hand it to. Uh, there's a couple of people that are going to be collecting them, but so so okay. So let's start thinking about the solution set here, and before we go into into power, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the solution that's quirk, that's coming from you know the frontier of technology from silicon valley um, and the solution the, their solution seems to me let's give up on the labor market you know um, let's just accept that workers will no longer be needed and so in order to you know to maintain people's living standards let's set up the universal basic income and so it'll be some massive redistribution program, and we don't really have to wor worry about you know how we organize work anymore. Now I kind of suspect what I'm, what you guys are going to say, but you know I'd love to hear your thought because this this idea is has a lot of traction. And so whoever wants to take it first. Well, I, I, okay, I, I can say a couple of things quickly. So so just one, um, yeah, I don't really like this idea. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so I think I think this idea of universal basic income and we just give up on the labor market is is sort of like this weakened expansion of the earned income tax credit forever and ever, right? Because I don't think work is actually going away. I'm back to my home health aides and everything. Like the, we still need people to do this work. Um, somebody's going to do it, and I and I think it's inexcusable that we don't pay them. So, so, so I think that that's just you know, and it, and it rests on sort of this this assumption that technology like rain is going to fall all over us and wash away all the jobs and like I just don't buy that so um, so I think you know so so on both of those premises I just I, I think I think that it's wrong and I and I think that if we're going to make a major public investment so back to what I was saying earlier around you know what reduces the cost of living I think we should think about what are some of the things that are really important to have institutional investment in right so I would you know say I would take that money and invest in free daycare right so everybody keeps talking about skills and college and everything but we know that education disparities start before kids even get to kindergarten. We know that working parents with young children are younger than working parents with college age children, which means that their wages are usually lower so that they're poorer, so they really need the help. Um, we know that um, we know that the way work is people, you know, paying for daycare is really expensive. In a lot of states, daycare is more expensive than college. And you know, right? Like, and many of us have been through this, right? Like, when I had my, when my kids were little, right? Like, like, okay, my ch paycheck goes to pay for daycare, and my husband's <laughs> paycheck pays for that. I mean, it's crazy, right? And and we're privileged people, so you just wonder how the heck does anybody else do this? Um, so, you know, but but also, like, so now they're one's in college, one's on the way, right? So, okay, I'd love free college. But, you know, <laughs> but I had the 18 years or so to save for college, right? And I had zero years to pay, save for daycare, right? And that just, like, like, like that is just crazy. So if we're going to invest in something that's going to help working families broadly, we should really be investing in that. The, the, the last thing I'll say on my argument against free college for stickers is if you look at the most recent BLS projections about what are the jobs that we have and what are the jobs that are going to grow, it's only about 25% of them that need a BA, right? So, you know, so it, it, we can't keep trying to put, you know, 80% of the labor market into 20% of the jobs that are the jobs that pay decently. That's just going to not be the solution to helping everybody kind of make a living in the world of work. So, 
Um, so I think that we really need to make sort of structural choices in the investments that we make that are lowering costs. Daycare is one I would do. Healthcare is one I would do. But I think if you just sort of say, oh, everybody's the same, and we'll just give you some income that's inadequate to basic needs, then I don't think you're really going to going to make people better off, and you're and I don't think you're going to like have everybody happily living home on their twelve thousand dollars a year. Felicia, did you want to jump in on this? Yeah, just on the basic income question in particular, it's actually quite interesting. Um, you know, first of all, I completely agree with Maureen and others. There is no way that that even I think the Silicon Valley guys. Their guys um, mostly don't think we can actually give up on the labor market, and they don't think that even the most extreme version of a quote freedom dividend at twelve thousand dollars a year, even per individual, so twelve thousand dollars a year times four for a family of four, I don't think that they really think that that is sufficient uh, to maintain, you know, a competitive standard of, li of living for most Americans. Nonetheless, I do think the, I, I have actually, we have, I've watched the UBI community kind of move over the last several years, and I do think it was born out of a combination, of, that idea was born out of a combination, three things. One, desperation. Two, this idea that s sort of a libertarian distrust of government giving directly to people is better than trying to go through some intermediary, which I don't agree with, but okay. Um, and then I think the third thing is this desire um, based on a lot of international experience that giving cash directly can sometimes be good in, uh, in certain situations. So I think that was the impetus for it. I think it's moved significantly since then. And the one thing I'll say about um, thinking about giving cash directly to people is this. Uh, at the Roosevelt Institute, we actually did a study of what a $12,000 a year uh, basic income would do uh, both to inflation and to inflation growth and jobs. Um, but we actually fund in our model, which we did with the Levy, which we ran with the Levy Institute um, up at Bard, we actually funded that out of public, it was, it was debt funded. And a debt funded, essentially public investment at that scale actually does drive significant growth and that growth will drive significant jobs. But if you think about that experiment just for a second, that was really an experiment about public financing. If you public financed anything, whether it's direct income or I don't know, a Green New Deal, right? You can, uh, obviously there are different effects depending on what you're gonna give the money to, but the argument is that public, there's enough slack in the economy currently, meaning underutilized resources, such that if you just borrowed money and spent it on things that were good, um, you would end up actually stimulating growth. It's a classic Keynesian argument. So one of the interesting things I think and undertold stories about this sort of conversation about UBI is depending on how you finance it, you can actually drive a kind of growth. Unfortunately, most of the basic income arguments out there, and then I think we shouldn't talk about that anymore, we should talk about actually how to raise wages within the labor market, but most of the basic income, um, you know, plans out there are either VAT funded or they are sort of, we're going to take away all the rest of your welfare and or safety net benefits and then give you cash instead, which does almost nothing for growth um, and will certainly not alleviate the kind of pain that basic income was supposed to, uh, you know, solve for in the first place. Yeah. So. Okay. So let's get into the labor market solutions. And I thought a way a way into this question might be interesting what to like to what if it and let's just kind of like assume power let's give ourselves more power now on what margins do you apply it and i'm thinking that the context as i see you know employers motivation today on average is to get rid of work you know i mean so that i think we're in a context of quite rapid automation, um, were it of, of quite intense outsourcing, what David Weil of the former DOL called fissuring, the idea of pushing workers out of your immediate vicinity into something else. And there's a bunch of institutions that, that are right now that, that determine the labor market function, you know, from wage and hour norms uh, to, you know, uh, minimum, minimum wage. So, so 
what, where does one, where do, does one start? What does one do, Randy? So I'm a big believer, even though we don't do very much of it in America, of sectoral bargaining, um, which could actually deal with, both in the public and the private sector, some of those issues. Um, but I think that we also have to think about, um, you know, a, a couple of things here in terms of even, and, and your last question and this question, not on um, universal basic, way, um, basic income, but on even where the tech companies were. 10 years ago in education, that's where the tech companies were. They were gonna replace all teachers, everything was gonna be done through technology. Now, in the next few days, probably Larry Berger and I are writing an op-ed together saying, Technology cannot supplant teachers. And, and this is, and part of this is, um, part of Larry Berger is from Amplify, big tech, education tech company, for those who don't know. Part of what has happened is that in a fast changing economic landscape, judgment actually matters. It matters if you're a home health aide, it matters if you're a school teacher, I would actually argue there's a whole lot of other job classifications where it really matters. The other thing that matters, relationship building, resilience, all of which are human endeavors. And I think that, that ultimately, um, the, that, that, that what we need to be aiming for and what sectoral bargaining can also help is thinking about living wages. And how do you get not to a minimum wage, but how do you get to a living wage? And what does that mean? And what should those averages be? And what and how do you use that kind of data? And then I also think we have to think about these big quadrants, for lack of a better word, of, of issues. Childcare, student debt, healthcare issues, and retirement issues. Because what happens if, in America, to actually deal with competition you didn't have to, employers didn't have to actually, and I'm not making the case for Medicare for all, and I actually have made the case for Medicare for all as a floor, not a ceiling with some choice, and, but, but what happens in the private sector, for example, if you could actually socialize retire, so, so you could socialize retirement costs, you could socialize daycare costs, you could socialize um, healthcare costs, so you could create a nimbleness both in the private sector and the public sector in terms of what we need to do. So if you could do some of the sectoral bargaining, you have to actually assume some power, <coughs> in particularly in industries like Lyft drivers, like, like, like um, Uber drivers, like all the gig economy, like you know the graduate workers. How do you actually create some power of so, so you can bargain for a living wage but and, 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 and for conditions, like in my space, nurses and guidance counselors, because well-being becomes absolutely essential. How do you actually bargain to have career tech ed workers within teaching and learning so we could actually teach coding to seventh graders and eighth graders? So, so there's a lot of things that could be really, really exciting if we had um, more power into, and more density but also if we thought about um, socializing these other costs. Great. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in. I've got some questions from the, from the audience. And, and, but I just want to throw one number on yeah. the table, um, and it does actually relate to unions. My colleague Suresh and I do wrote a paper actually for this uh, conference. Um, but, uh, you know, the historical data will show that unions provide a wage premium of between 15 and 20 percent, yeah. right? Um, no matter what the sector, no matter what the density, and um, no matter what the type of job actually is. And so, like, I think unions provide benefits beyond wages, but straight up on wages, if that's what we're talking about, um, unions are a huge part of the solution. As obviously, you can talk about legislative solutions as well, mm -hmm. um, but unions have to be a big part yeah. of the solution set. And I will just close before we get to the questions by saying, and that is why when we started the original discussion and we talked about the 30-year period where we had 
much higher level of collective bargaining protections in this country, and we saw the upward, upward trajectory of, uh, of, of income and wages that we don't want, we want to make sure that as we're talking about some of the solutions to these problems, that we also look at making sure that at the federal level and, and certainly at the state and local level that we're looking to strengthen collective bargaining. And there are some good policies that are out there doing, that, that can potentially do that right now including the uh, Protecting Right to Organizing Act that I know that, that we are uh, very supportive of as well. And so I do think that as we, as we look to these solutions, let's not forget the one solution that we know would be helpful because of the reasons that a lot of us have said during this panel. Let's make sure that we, we go back to um, um, really protecting collective bargaining rights and collective representation and a voice at work in the workplace. I'll just throw in a slightly different idea. Another thing that is associated with sort of higher wages than peers is companies that have significant employee ownership. And I think employee ownership is an important strategy that we could incentivize more of um, that helps both improve the quality of jobs as well as improve people's wealth building opportunities. So. And, and listen, I, I think I, this, this question has to be asked. I mean, we're talking about work power in a context where what, 7% of workers are unionized right now, roughly? Um, the in the private sector, sector yeah. 30% of the So sector. what, uh, so give us some, some, some ideas, what's necessary, how can we, I think you actually raised the question in your first answer, but so what are the ideas out there that are worth looking at? Well, first you have, um, I mean look, that and, and not just that Felicia is here, and not just that I love serving on the Roosevelt board, but look at the, in the, 20s to the 30s, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, one of the things that Roosevelt did was was help create a much more robust labor law. Without Taft-Hartley, the National Labor Relations Act, what Vinnie just said is we need to have um, the um, ability to organize and bargain um, in a way that where we can help create worker power. You know, you can either agonize or you can organize. But when all the workers who want to organize get fired, it's uh, it doesn't it it retards <laughs> union <laughs> growth. Um, but there's a lot we we have to do uh, a bunch of the things to actually make the policy landscape a much um, much more amenable for worker organization, not just in the traditional employee employer context but I'm gonna be a little bit radical here. This whole notion of independent contractors versus employees is, sorry, it's crazy. It also hugely undermines the ability of workers to get together. And we have to actually look at the trust laws and the way in which they operate. We have to look at the bankruptcy laws and the way in which they operate. And we have to actually think about American ingenuity and give workers the ability to come up with various different ways of collectively getting together to actually create that density, including more employee-owned um, and shares of business, because you have to kind of you have to kind of marry both this notion of power uh, or these notions of power, density, and responsibility. And if you have those things together, where people feel a real kinship and ownership of the institution. Even when you are in an employee-employer relationship, then you're also creating a better, a different alignment. And in the public sector, the alignment you're creating is making a difference in the lives of the people that you're serving, not just the people you're representing. Okay, I want to squeeze a question in here that I found really interesting from, from, from the audience. They're asking why it's just old people like us sitting on this panel. Why aren't there any millennials? <laughs> And, and but uh, that raises uh, to me kind of an interesting an interesting question: Is the experience of the labor market that we're talking about is there a generational component? Is there any generational divide? Are, are the younger workers experiencing the labor market in a different way than you know our generation of old people? Um, w that could you know call for maybe a different way of looking at the problem and the solutions. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. I have no idea. Look, the uh, younger people in my union are the ones who actually are going on strike, and they're actually more frustrated. Yeah. And actually, they're the ones who have actually raised the possibility 
that through um, working together, you can accomplish what you can't accomplish individually. And I think that it's um, uh, some of our younger leaders are just, I mean, they're awesome. And they're giving a lot of inspiration, but they are actually, younger workers want unions more. And actually, younger workers see the power and balance more. Yeah, I think younger workers are experiencing sort of the break of, as you brought up in the beginning, Randy, that sort of there's this narrative that if you work hard, you go to school, um, you're going to be able to succeed. And they're experiencing the disconnect of that narrative the most, right? So our millennial generation is the best educated, and yet they have lower earnings and less wealth than previous generations did at their age. So, you know, it's not surprising that they're, they're frustrated. So maybe they just have something else to do than be on this panel. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and their margin for error is, um, I'm amazed at how small it is given the burdens of student debt that they have, the, the fact that they have to quite often fund their own um, retirement, to, uh, that they have to pay for their own health benefits, that they have to, that they're working for multiple employers. So I, I think that there's a, there, real, there is a level of, of fear that a lot of them do have and insecurity that maybe, you know, I, I didn't have when I started out 30 years ago. So we try to certainly bring them in into the fold. I know for, certainly in our, in our office, but um, in a lot of the discussions that we have to make sure that we're getting their perspective because I think their, their perspective is, is vastly different sometimes from uh, folks that might be in, the, in, in our age group without. <laughs> And I'll just quickly add that, you know, uh, younger workers, younger people um, live in this very weird world where they have absolutely no faith in any institution, nor really should they, given the world into which they were born. Uh, they haven't seen institutions really stand up for things that they would like to see happen, on the one hand. On the other hand, they are the ones who are begging for government action on climate, yeah. mm -hmm. begging Right, so they are the ones who are saying, you know, who Sunrise is made up of a bunch of 21 year olds, right? And so it's very interesting that kind of at this edge of desperation, they're still willing to kind of put their whole selves on the line to ask for institutional reform and institutional like movement. Great, and I just wanted to, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I wanted to throw another question at you. When I asked about, you know, what, how to acquire power, correct me if I'm wrong, but the answer seemed to be we need policy change. We need laws that make it easier to organize. I'm thinking, okay, let's just, let's, th that's, a, that's a tough one. So, you know, let's assume within the current legal framework, what are the p opportunities? And there are different models out there. The Fight for 15 guys are trying something different. You know, in California, talking to the to the to the political system to try to get the uh, contractors, the Uber drivers, classified as employees. There are other margins on which to operate. And I'd love to hear your thought about you know what the opportunities are. Well, we um, not not to be prepared for this question, <laughs> but <laughs> we have a little um, palm card outside. Because what we've tried to actually do, and, and look, um, we've faced a lot of existential threats as the AFT in the last few years, including the threat um, of the Janus decision, which was essentially which made the entire public sector right to work, and where the people who brought that case, which is basically right-wing anti-union extremists, thought that we would all collapse and that people would just basically want to still get representation but not feel the power of belonging. And there is something we learned from this, which is the power of engagement, the power of building community is, is, a, is really important. And so one of the things I've learned is that, you know, you don't, as I said before, you don't agonize, you organize. You try to actually change policy, change these things, but we're basically up to the same number without agency fee payers that we had with agency fee payers a couple of years ago, which is we're, we're, we're hovering around 1.7 million. And what we've done is we've actually um, thought about two different, three different things, which is how do you go from values to actions and how do you go from narrative to organizing? And it's really important, particularly if you are teachers and nurses, that um, that you that 
that the community sees you as part of community and you are seen as part of community. And so we've been involved in how do we engage our members? How do we build an outward facing union where community sees what we're fighting for as relevant to them as well? And how do we do things in terms of campaigns? And that has made us incredibly dynamic in terms of the work that we're doing. Anybody want to take it on? Vinny, would you? Well, I'll I'm, I just no. want to oh, cool. sec second your I'll building like community that. because um, I think that that's really important. And I think just, um, the, you know, I think how do you build power? Well, I think you have to sort of uh, say to what end you want to use it. And, you know, and you have to build trust, right? Because that's one of the things we really see, of course, is that people have lost faith in government. They've lost faith in businesses. They've lost faith in so many institutions. So how do you work within community and rebuild that community so you can rebuild trust and have a sense that um, the power is going to be used to something that makes sense to people? And I think this is where the narrative power piece is a really important thing to think about because, you know, sort of this storyline of go to school, work hard, and you'll do okay, and that hasn't worked, and so it's like, okay, you fed me a line on that one, am I really gonna buy your next line, right? Like, so you really have to think about, it, are you coming up with something that's, that's not only an appealing narrative, but actually makes sense to people in the reality that they're living in? Um, and I know you're gonna end soon, so I just have to like squeeze in one thing that um, since, you know, I, like, I, I spend a lot of time talking with sort of small and medium employers, and you know, a lot of them actually really care about their workers and the quality of the jobs, and they're really struggling to figure a lot of things out. And um, and I just I just want to want to say that because I don't run into that many employers that are sort of saying like, what I really want to do is just oppress my workers every day and drive them into poverty. Like that is not what they're thinking, right? But I think that again, sort of like, how do you start to surface kind of what people's lived experience is? and figure out where are those forms where you can have an honest conversation, build trust, and start to solve those problems, that's where you can start to build community even across those lines and, and move forward. Yeah, I think um, one of the things which I just is important because we do want to be, I want to echo that sentiment and be a little hopeful as well when we talk about the dire cir circumstances of, as we said, 40% of Americans that can't come up for $400 emergency money. We know all the statistics, 75% living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. But at the same token, I think if we approach this, yes, with making sure that we are supporting collective bargaining, which I think is really critical as we made that point here because of the d dynamic of power in the workplace. But in addition, pursue policies which are gonna lead to broad-based prosperity and create this synergy which needs to exist, this ecosystem, between uh, reforms in tax policy, uh, corporate governance, fiscal policy, monetary policy, a lot of different um, issues that we, we, we get swamped down and, and, and talk about all the details with that we could talk for days on. Those are really important because we've gone off the rails certainly with, with regard to and respect to the security that working people used to feel that they had more of in this country. And, and it certainly has, 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 has derailed over the past uh, several decades, and we wanna do something about it. But I, I don't think that we wanna just look at, at one solution and say that is the one specific thing that we have to do that's gonna change the paradigm. Because this is a much deeper problem now. And I think that working at reforms in a host of different, of, 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 of different areas is very important to create this, this synergy between different governments, federal, state, local government, policies which exist, funding that we know and investments which need to take place and support ultimately for collective bargaining and to have uh, protections in the workplace, then we can begin to address some of these problems that we're seeing each and every day. Guys, thank you very much for coming. Let's give them a hand to our panel.